Hi, welcome to the wonderful world of water. Let's make some bugs today. We're actually going to do three different things, but first we're going to start out by making some bugs that actually float on the surface of water rather than sinking down like a boat into the water. And we're going to make those bugs out of metal, which normally sinks, but we're going to learn how to fold it in a special way that takes advantage of something called surface tension that makes it difficult for objects to kind of punch through the surface of the water. Secondly, we're going to investigate some other properties of water that make it stretchy. Uh, for example, we're going to look at bubbles, now perhaps in a way you've never looked at them before, um, and we're going to compare water that's stretchy to water that gets compressed into tiny little balls like you may see in raindrops or dewdrops on, on leaves. And then finally, we're, some of you may choose to make a scientific instrument that allows us to measure the strength of this surface tension of water and really many other liquids. Uh, all these materials can be made with ordinary household uh, things that you have, usually in your kitchen, but in case you don't have some of the critical items, uh, we've supplied a bag that you can pick up at your library that contains the uh, three basic items. Uh, first, there's a piece of aluminum foil that you can use to make some kinds of water bugs. Secondly, there is a straw that you're going to use to for several purposes, but you're going to mainly use it to generate static electricity that will pull your water striders or your water bugs around on a surface of water. And then finally, there's about three feet of a special kind of very thin wire that's very easy to cut and bend. And we're going to also use that to make uh, water bugs. And I'm going to show you how to make some very simple ones and show you the techniques. And then I hope that you'll allow your creativity to come up with some new designs of bugs that perhaps nature has never designed, but, but we'll see. Now there's a couple of other items that you'll have around your house that you'll want to use. One is a uh, shallow pan, a fairly large pan, oh, maybe a foot in diameter or so. Uh, cake pans work well to allow your bugs to roam around on a surface of water. You may want to have a whole set of bugs to, uh, to form a pack and, uh, and move around. Uh, and you'll also need a pair of scissors to cut the wire and the foil and some tape uh, and a paper clip might also be handy. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn the camera around and we're going to start right in to figuring out how to make metal bugs that float on water. Now our first bug is very simple. He only has four legs and I'm shining a light from the top into this pan of water and I want you to notice that there are four pretty big shadows under his legs. Uh, that's one way you know that his legs are making good contact with the water, but he is floating. And what we can do is take our ordinary straw, rub it on a piece of cloth or a piece of paper to form a little static electricity, and you can see that we can move him around pretty much any way we want. Uh, now, this is technically not an insect, but because it only has four legs, uh, however, it's the one of the easiest ones to make. And I think you probably want to start with a four-legged bug, uh, at least when you're using the wire, and get him to move around and get comfortable with making the different uh, shapes. Now I'm going to pick him up if I don't sink him and see what he looks like up close. And you notice how the legs have a nice curve at the end. And when you're making a an insect or a bug that floats on water, you want to test it by putting it down on a flat surface and making sure that all the legs hit at the same time. That way they're going to apply equal force to the water and he will uh, float successfully. 
Now, before I show you how to make that, I'll show you some other styles that you can consider. For example, you can make one with just three legs. Not too many bugs have three legs. But you can see that you have three nice little shadows. He's floating and he's, he's very tall off the water and you can move him around. How easily he moves around is a good indication that he's on the surface and not underwater uh, or partially underwater like a boat would be. And we'll come back to boats in a few minutes. Now, another style that you might choose to make is using aluminum foil. And I'll show you how to make that in a second. All you do is set it on the water. There's a four-legged one. Here's a large six-legged one. Here's a tiny six-legged one. And you can see you can drop those and they tend not to sink even though they're made out of aluminum, which as you probably know is heavier uh, or more dense than water. Now, let's, uh, let's figure out how we might actually make this using a piece of aluminum foil. Now, <clears throat> I would suggest you start with aluminum foil because it's going to be a little easier to work with than water. And the piece you have is going to be about this big. And you can use ordinary pair of scissors to first cut it in half so you have another piece to work with if the first one doesn't go so well. And then you fold it in half again, like this. And now you're in a position to take the open ends and cut out some legs. And I'm going to make this one a four-legged one. So I'm going to make a cut here. And I'm going to make a cut here. And then I'm going to cut away the middle. So now I have a U-shape. And I'm going to open it up at the bottom. And I'm going to fold out these legs. And here's the fun part. You just make a nice little curve at the each end at each end. And those little curves where the legs flatten out are the key to making it support well. Now I haven't tested this one. Let's see if it's going to work. Sure enough, it floats. And if I take my little straw, I can see that I can move him around quite easily. Now there's a couple of other ways you can move him around. One, you could you could blow on him with a straw, a big storm, and he can he can move pretty quickly. But I think the static electricity is a little bit more fun. And even more fun is something we're going to try at the end of the experiment because it ruins the water once we try it. But if you put a drop of soap or dishwashing detergent uh, on one side of him, you will see that he'll dart away from that soap because the soap reduces the surface tension in the water and it makes a little wave that pushes it away. I think you'll find that uh, pretty fun. Okay, so that's how you make a simple four-legged one with some tin foil. You could do six or you could do a spider with eight. Uh, you could do three. Uh, you could have a contest if you'd like. Could you make one stand on end? How tall could you make a tinfoil uh, bug or statue, really, that would actually stand up on water? Okay, I'm going to let you be as creative as you want with the tinfoil. But now I want to look a little bit at how to work with this wire. And the first thing you do is straighten out the loop that it came in, try not to get it tangled, and I would suggest cutting off about two inches or so of the wire with a pair of scissors. Carefully put the rest of the wire away so it doesn't get all tangled. Fold it in half like this. Let me see and then cut it at the middle. 
So now you have two pieces about an inch long. And all we really have to do is cross them over the center and twist it. Two, three, four, and we'll try about five. And now we use some of the same bending technique. We bend it like this so the legs are facing down but then they turn up or flatten out at the end and we apply that to each end. Now this is a pretty small one. The hardest part is not making the insects but figuring out how to test them and then setting them down gently. Because I'm on camera here, I'm going to try this with a pair of tweezers. You don't need to use tweezers. You just need to be careful. And I'm going to set him down. There he goes. And what you want to look for, if all three or if all four legs are touching the water, they're going to form nice dimples and shadows on the bottom of your pan that indicate that each of those legs is pressing down on the surface tension but not breaking through. Now, for example, if I try to put him in the water like this, when it's tilted on end, whoops, he's a good floater, he didn't sink. There we go. If I put him like this, you can see he sinks. And you know he sank because there's no shadows. He's sitting on the bottom of the pan. Now I'll shake him off. And oops, there he goes. Now notice on this one, there's only three shadows. And that tells me that one of those three legs is not, uh, it's either slightly a, uh, below the water or above the water. It's not forming a dimple. So we might want to take him out and rebend him. Now, if you want him, you'll find out that when you twist these together, sometimes the, the twist is not tight. If you like, you can use a tiny drop of glue or nail polish right in the middle and let it dry and that will stiffen him up and he won't uh, have a tendency to, uh, to get out of shape as much. Now, in addition to the four legs, there's no reason that you can't cut three pieces the same length, twist those together and make a true six-legged insect. Another option you have, you might have, if you want to get creative, is let's just take a length of wire and make a loop on one end and make a tail on that wire. Now this is not going to be an insect, but what we want to do, let me tilt the camera up so you can see, if I set it down on a table and it stands up by itself, well that's a good start. Now let's see if this will actually be supported. Let's turn it down again. There we go. Now you can see there's three spots where that loop is hitting the water, which is not perfect, but it's as high, oh, it's uh, more than the length of my hand. It's uh, about six inches above the water. Uh, for this one loop of wire. And you could really have a contest to say, take a foot of your wire and see how much of that foot you can get supported uh, above the surface. So when you're making, and you might think about that when you're making insects of various types, you could have one that's pretty low to the water like this, or you could make an effort to make it taller and taller and see if he would float. Now, you're going to notice when you try this that not all of your insects are going to work the first time. And I have a feeling this might be, uh, this guy might have a little problem, but let's see if we can get him to stay up. And I'm going to set him down. Oops. Well, two of his legs stayed up and the other two sank. Uh, his body looks like, if you can see where I've wrapped around the extra wire in the center, he's probably just a little bit too heavy or maybe, you see the curve at the end of this leg, how it's kind of sharp? Maybe he just needs to be smoothed out a little bit, like so. 
And if we work with them, and again, it's important to test them on dry land to make sure that all the legs are together. And I won't use the tweezers this time, and let's see if he'll do better. There he goes. So by just changing the bend of the legs, you can see an improvement. Now, that's kind of the basics of doing uh, insects that float on water. But I want to show you a couple of little features that are pretty interesting as you design an insect leg. And all I've done is taken a piece of wire and curved one piece of wire. And I'm going to press it. And let me move the camera a little closer. So you can see. And I'm going to press it against the water. And you see that little shadow, that little dimple beneath it? And I'm pressing. And then all of a sudden, pop. It pops through the surface of the water. Well, that kind of comes from the term surface tension. The surface of the water exerts a force back upon the wire until it doesn't, until it breaks through. Once it gets below the surface of the water, the forces are the same in all directions. However, when it's on the surface of the water, it's a uh, kept above or right on the surface by the force that we call surface tension. And as I said at the end of the video, I'll show you a method that you can actually measure it uh, and compare water of different types. But you can actually feel the pressure it takes to push one wire under the water. And I encourage all of you to try that. Just hold the wire between your thumb and your forefinger very loosely and press the curved wire against the surface until it pops through. Now you'll notice if I stick the wire straight down there's going to be very little resistance and that's why you want your legs for your insects to be uh, on the flat side. Now another feature uh, that's, in, that's pretty important about water is, let's get this tin foil out of the way, and let's move in real close to a single drop of water. I think you can see I've taken an eyedropper and I've placed it on a little piece of, this is called Teflon tape, and the interesting thing is that that drop of water is standing up uh, very high and it makes kind of a very nice small round uh, sphere and the reason it does that is the surface tension of the water pulls it into a spherical shape. That's why raindrops tend to be rounded. Uh, dew drops that you can see on uh, leaves and grass uh, after a rain are round because of surface tension but those drops are not going to be the same shape on every bit of material. So, for example, if I take my eyedropper and drop it on the surface of wood right next to it, it's the same amount of drop, and you see how it's flattened out and it's kind of spread out? Well, that's the combination of the surface that the water is resting on and the property of surface tension of the water. Whenever you see something uh, flat, that indicates that uh, perhaps it's not very water repellent. Now, now you might be wondering, what's the difference between surface tension and the force that we call buoyancy that enables boats to float. And here I've taken a little triangular piece of our tin foil and I've folded it into a little crude uh, boat shape and now I'm going to take some some cargo for the boat and I'm going to put three of these very small little nuts in the boat and see what happens. Well, it's still floating and the reason it floats is that the more weights that I put in it, it 
pushes it down into the water and as long as the amount of water that is displaced by the weight of the boat and its cargo uh, is less than the weight uh, of the boat, we are going to be floating and that's called buoyancy. But I've made something that I think will illustrate the difference between surface tension and buoyancy by modifying my boat a little bit. Oh no! It's a boat, but the bottom has been cut out. So the question is, if I put that in the... What? It's still floating. But certainly if I put cargo in this boat, and yet it still floats. It's an aluminum boat with a huge hole in the bottom. And I'm going to put these nuts around the outside. And if we get in close, I think we can just see how that water is kind of starting to bulge up through the bottom. But the surface tension is essentially preventing the water from pushing up through the bottom. Now, of course, if I keep pushing, and I keep pushing, it sinks because indeed the aluminum in its cargo is more dense than water. And once it goes, once the surface tension is broken, it dives beneath the surface and it doesn't return. Of course, you may say that that boat didn't have a large enough hole in it. What if we took a piece of aluminum and essentially cut it all out so there's nothing but a frame around the outside? What? That floats too. And again, it's supported by surface tension. And if I push it beneath, now there's probably a little air caught underneath the edges, but once it goes down, it's now coming back up. But if I pick it up, and again, it's supported, and you can see all those shadows on the bottom indicating where it's touching this. So you might get creative and think of all the different shapes out of aluminum foil that you might make that are supported by surface tension and not by the amount of water it displaces. Uh, that is what we call buoyancy. Now I promised that I would show you what happens if we take one of our little simple insects and what if I drop I'm not going to be able to do any more experiments once I get done with this, but let's real quickly, I'm going to move it back a little bit so you can see it properly. Let's scoot up. And I'm going to make one drop right behind it of soap. And I'm just going to touch it to the water. And I think you can see what happened. Now if I do it on the other side, I keep dropping it around. Whoops! You can see that now the surface tension, because it has soap added to it, it is no longer able to support. And this is interesting because that's also, you remember how we were using static electricity with our little uh, rubbing paper on a straw to pull the metal around. The uh, soap actually influences the attraction of the molecules of the water on the surface and as you add soap to it, it reduces that attraction and lowers the surface tension and therefore it won't support as much, uh, as much weight. So if you're a water strider, you want to be very careful not to get soap in the stream. Now, an interesting feature that water striders are actually predators and they're hunters on top of the surface of the water and they tend to prey on other insects that have fallen into the water and aren't supported uh, by the same uh, style of legs that the uh, 
that the water strider has. So the water strider is able to move around uh, quickly by, by rowing uh, several of its legs, uh, just like oars on a boat, and attack these other insects that can't move around because they're uh, partially submerged. So that's why they're effective uh, hunters of the water. And uh, this spring and summer, if you're nearby a, uh, a stream or uh, a pond, you might look around the edges and see if you see any actual water striders and see how they compare to the ones that, that you are making yourself. Now here's a device that we can use to actually measure the strength of surface tension in water or really any other fluid. And it's called a surface tension balance. And it's very simple. Again, it only uses household materials. Uh, I like to use a tin can to support uh, a fulcrum for the balance. And this is just a straightened out paper clip. Okay. And then I've found at the center of a straw poked a hole in it. Uh, and by the way, if uh, you may want to have your parents help you with this, particularly if you're poking holes in straws so you don't uh, uh, poke a hole in your finger instead. Uh, but what we have then on one end is a cone made out of a circle of paper uh, taped together in a cone shape. And by the way, there are detailed instructions uh, on how to make this device in the uh, description of the video that if you're interested in making it you can use that and then on the other end we have a piece of our wire uh, and it's just formed into a circle and I've used a piece of thread to uh, hold the wire in place with a little loop and I in this case rather than have it on the surface I want to balance it so it's suspended just below the surface because surface tensions, tension works both ways. It keeps objects from pushing through the surface going down and it also limits objects from going through the surface pushing up. So it works the same each way. And then I've wrapped another small piece of wire around the straw to balance it so that I can make sure that it hangs directly beneath the surface. And now I take some weights and you can use anything you want. It, you, it needs to be small so you can uh, compare relatively small differences in surface tension. I'm using grains of ordinary rice and I can put them in one at a time and let's watch what happens as I put those in. There's two, three, and this is the quantitative part, four, five, and you can see it's starting to pull against the surface, six, now it's on the surface, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 15, 16, 17, it's really pulling hard, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, it's getting very close, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. 
Okay, it took 44 grains of rice to pull the ring out of the water. And assuming those grains all weighed the same, which is probably not exactly true, but uh, it's, they're reasonably even. Uh, now, I'll leave it to you to do the other part of the experiment. What would happen if I added a drop of soapy water to this pan on the one side? Would it take more or less grains of rice to pull it free from the water? Uh, and I'll leave that to you for an experiment. And uh, I hope to hear from uh, your librarians what you found out. And you might also want to share with your library uh, staff the insect creations that you have made. And uh, I'm sure they'll uh, share any photos you have with me as well. Uh, and I can uh, put it on in a gallery of exciting uh, design challenges that are met by the students who watch this video. Now I'm going to do two little experiments that, uh, again, I encourage you to try at home <clears throat> with two kinds of water. One, this is plain water, and then on the right in this green pan, I have a little bit of soapy water. I'm going to take my straw and I'm going to blow into the plain water. And you can see, while you get a few small bubbles, they pop quickly and they never get very large. You see how they, they form and then they pop. And the reason that they pop <coughs> is the surface tension of the water is so strong, it doesn't allow them to get very big before that, that pressure uh, collapses them. But while water can be very stretchy, if you reduce the surface tension enough by adding some uh, dishwashing detergent, is my favorite, uh, to the water, what we can do is make a classic bubble. Now, you know, I like bubbles as much as anybody else, but I like to make half bubbles so we can examine them a little closely. And remember, this is soapy water, and I'm just going to blow in it and see what happens. Now you can see we've made quite a large bubble. And the only reason that bubble can get that large without breaking is that we've reduced the surface tension uh, by adding a small amount of detergent to that water. Uh, and that bubble takes the same shape as the small droplets that we saw on on leaves uh, or on that white tape uh, earlier. And the interesting thing about a soap bubble is that it's an extremely thin layer of water and soap. And you'll notice uh, the nice thing about stationary bubbles is you can watch the color change. Whoop! Let's watch that again. What happens to the bubbles is they get thin from the top and as they get thin instead of having that colorful rainbow pattern that you're beginning to see eventually they will form a little black spot on top and that is actually allowing you to know that the bubble is getting thinner and thinner and once that black spot begins to grow and let's kind of expand it so we can see it There, you see that the ring in the center? And it's going to turn black, and then it's going to expand. Now that is very, very, very small fraction of an inch. And you can see those circular colors. Each band of color indicates uh, a thinner and thinner surface. And that round, clear, or black layer in the center is now expanding rapidly. And when it gets to a certain point, it's going to be too thin to support it, and it's going to pop. And let's see when that 
is actually going to happen. This is one of the best ones that I've seen. If I don't talk too much and create too many air currents, it's getting larger and larger. You can see there's no color at the top at all, except the green base of the pan. And it's about a third of the way down now. There it goes. Wait for it. Wow. That's a tiny, tiny, boom, fraction of a thousandth of a thousandth of an inch thick for that bubble. I encourage you to blow some stationary bubbles, or in this case, half bubbles, uh, at home and explore what happens as they begin to thin out. And you might also experiment with, well, what happens if you just add one drop of soap to uh, a container of water, say this, uh, this size? Uh, how big a bubble can you blow versus adding uh, a tablespoon of, of uh, detergent or soap to it? Does it make a difference on how easy it is to blow the bubbles. Well, let's conclude this video by encouraging you all to experiment with creative folding of aluminum foil and wire and see just how exciting you may make your insects. Now, I don't want to give away too many things, but you'll notice this little insect guy I put a little dot of uh, nail polish on either side to kind of make his eyes. Uh, you can get as creative as you want on drawing designs on the body. Uh, and if you're, if you're really brave, you might try making an insect out of multiple materials. Uh, for example, you might try making the body out of a toothpick and then wrapping small pieces of wire around the body to form the legs and then decorating the toothpick uh, appropriately. You might add antenna, uh, you might add uh, wings uh, if you like, but you can get as creative as you want. The key thing is the in insect has to be pretty light. Uh, even though he's made out of metal or aluminum foil and other bits and pieces, uh, he can only support so much weight above the surface uh, and be effective uh, in his movements. Okay, well thank you very much for watching and uh, I hope to see some of your images very soon.